Hi, I'm Jennifer. Welcome to Grace. I'm Dick. I'm Karen. Welcome, Welcome to, to Grace. Grace. Hi, I'm Belinda. Welcome to Grace. My name is Tal. I'm senior pastor here at Grace United Methodist Church. This is an exciting place, and one of the things that I find most exciting about it is that this is a place where everyone is welcome to come and drink deeply from the grace of Jesus Christ. So we're honored that you joined us for this time of worship today. You honor us by being here and sharing this time with us. In a few moments, Pastor Patricia is going to share with us about putting on the armor of God. So we invite you to just sit back and be blessed by the time we'll share together. Welcome to Grace. We invite you at home to sing today's hymn with us for the beauty of the earth. The scripture reading today is from Ephesians chapter 6, verses 10 through 18, using the message translation. And that about wraps it up. God is strong, and he wants you strong. So take everything the Master has set out for you, well-made weapons of the best materials, and put them to use so you will be able to stand up to everything the devil throws your way. This is no afternoon athletic contest that we'll walk away from and forget about in a couple of hours. This is for keeps, a life or death fight to the finish against the devil and all his angels. Be prepared. You're up against far more than you can handle on your own. Take all the help you can get, every weapon God has issued, so that when it's all over but the shouting, you'll still be on your feet. Truth, righteousness, peace, faith, and salvation are more than words. Learn how to apply them. You'll need them throughout your life. God's word is an indispensable weapon. In the same way, prayer is, an essential, is essential in this ongoing warfare. Pray hard and long. Pray for your brothers and sisters. Keep your eyes open. Keep each other's spirits up so that no one falls behind or drops out. This is the word of God for us, the people of God. Thanks be to God. Please join us in reciting the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, 
who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. The third day he rose from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Hi guys, today I have a special guest joining us for the children's message, Judy. In Ephesians, we hear that we're supposed to put on the armor of God. The armor of God is like a superhero suit. It protects you, but it also helps you protect and take care of others. In our church, we have lots of superheroes, people who God has called to help us get through really hard times, to protect us, to love and care for us. Sometimes we can tell these people by the outfits they have on, their superhero clothes. Let's see some of those now. Oh, those are great superhero costumes. But that's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about those special outfits we wear to let people know that we are here and called by God to serve them. Let's try it again. People called by God to serve in church often wear different robes and sashes to signify who they are and what role they play. We also have other superheroes in our church that work outside of our walls. They're the hospital staff and paramedics, those that come to our aid when we're hurt or scared or need help outside of the church walls. Let's take a look at the armor of God they wear. Let us say a prayer together. Lord God, Thank you for the courageous men and women who have chosen such difficult and dangerous jobs. Thank you for your sacrifices and service. Thank you for their hard work in training and preparing. Help us to find ways to be superheroes for you too. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Hi, I'm Patricia DiGiuseppe, one of the pastors at Grace Methodist Church. Well, today you get to see me with my eyes open. Usually you just see me with my eyes closed praying. So I'm happy to be here and to be preaching today. So you see me with my eyes open. To those of you who are members of our church, we miss you greatly and we love you. We look forward to the day when we can worship together in the sanctuary. Love to see the sanctuary filled with people again. And to those who are guests, we hope that you'll be blessed as we join together in worshiping our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. We are at war, aren't we? The whole world is at war right now. We're in a life or death struggle. One of the hardest things about this battle is we're fighting an enemy we can't see. We don't know where it's gonna show up next. We can see it under a microscope, but most of us don't carry microscopes around with us. Although we can't see this enemy with our eyes, we know its name. Its name is coronavirus. And I read that it was named corona because under the microscope it looks like a crown. You know that very name could cause us to be intimidated. We associate a crown with power, with authority. Kings wear crowns and they have power and authority over multitudes of people. They have the power of life and death. The coronavirus has power. According to Reuters, it has infected more than four million people across the world. And it has killed almost 300,000 people. In America, it has infected about one and a half million people and it has killed more than 80,000. In North Carolina, it has infected 16,000 people and it's killed nearly 600. And in New Hanover County, it has infected 123 people and killed three. Healthcare workers and paramedics have seen its power. They wear personal protective equipment 
when they're around it. They cover their faces with masks and shields, and they cover their bodies with gowns, and they wear gloves on their hands. They're covered head to toe in personal protective equipment. We see on the news every day how many people have been infected and how many people have died from this virus. In a way, it's easy to be casual about this disease because we can't see it, and so we don't know where it is. We can't tell by looking who has it or who doesn't have it. When we think about four million people being infected in the world, and only 123 in New Hanover County, with just three dying, that doesn't sound so bad. But if one of those people is a member of your family, then it's serious. On March 14th, I officiated at a wedding in our church here. This was before the rule that you couldn't have more than 10 people meeting together. To be cautious, our wedding director stood at the door spraying everybody's hands with hand sanitizer as they came in. And before the wedding, we asked everybody to um, try to not hug as hard as it is at a wedding and to try not to shake hands, to be conscious of the virus and of, um, not spreading it. To be honest, I felt like we were being overly cautious, but I changed my mind a week later when I had an email from the groom saying that the best man had come down with coronavirus. Oh my goodness, he stood next to me. I took the rings from his hand for, and for the bride and groom. That could be scary. And then I thought, what am I supposed to do? That must be somebody I'm supposed to call. So I told my husband first, Pat, now, my husband and I are considered to be at the vulnerable age, and then he has some health issues as well. So I was concerned more for him, really, than for me. But this was serious. So we did what everybody does in a panic. We called 911. And of course, they told us to call the health department, which we did. And so then we were quarantined for 14 days. We had to be in separate rooms. and. That's not easy when we live in a four-room condo, not a four-bedroom, a four-room condo. And we had to sleep in separate beds, and me on the sofa, and I gave him the king-size bed. And for two weeks, we had to be as separate from each other as we could be. Some mornings, I would wake up with a little bit of a scratchy throat, or other times a headache, or um, didn't ever have a fever, didn't ever really have symptoms, and nor did he. But each time I had any kind of... Uh, discomfort, I thought, is, is this the virus or is this just um, allergies from the spring? Well, finally, I called the doctor. He said I was probably okay, because unless I had fever or had shortness of breath, and if I did, then call him immediately or call 911. But I really wondered if I would get the virus and if I would die from it, because people have died within a matter of days from that virus, or would my husband die? And frankly, I wasn't ready to die yet. There are things I still wanted to do. So I prayed to the Lord to please let Pat and me live. And I'm grateful that he did answer my prayer. And neither one of us had any symptoms at all of coronavirus. In fact, my doctor suggested out of an abundance of caution, I stay self-quarantined for a month, which I did, and worked from home. But during that time, I had some time to think. Above all, I wanted to be sure everything was right between God and me. You know, when you're facing what might be the end, you want to be sure that you're right with God and that there's nothing that you've forgotten to take care of where he's concerned. So I repented of anything I could think of and asked God to please remind me if there was something else. And I forgave anybody who had hurt me and asked God to let me know if I was leaving anybody out. I wasn't really afraid because I really do believe that if I had the virus and if I died from it, as Paul said, it would be better for me because I would go on to heaven to be with Jesus. But I just wasn't ready to go to heaven yet. But when I came close to the coronavirus, I took it seriously then. I realized it was a battle. And not just a physical battle, but it was a spiritual battle as well. The Bible says we're up against far more than we can handle. We're not fighting against people of flesh and blood but we're fighting against rulers and powers whom we can't see. We're fighting against evil spirits, the Bible says, who have power in the air. But when we give our heart to God, then our enemies become his enemies. 
And when the invisible enemy of coronavirus comes against us, then God has invisible weapons that he gives us to fight it. He gives us his armor. And just like the healthcare workers, God tells us to clothe ourselves in his armor. God's armor is our personal protection equipment. And the Bible tells us to wear it like clothes. The first piece of God's armor is truth. We put on truth as a belt, the Bible says, to hold everything together. The night before Jesus was killed on the cross, he had a Passover meal with his closest followers, and he told them he was going away to prepare a place for them, and then he would come back and receive them to himself so that they would be with him where he was. He said, you know where I'm going, and so you know the way. And Thomas, one of his followers, said, Lord, we don't know where you're going, and how can we know the way? Jesus said to him, I am the way and the truth and the life. He said, no one comes to the Father except through me. A controversial thing for Jesus to say. How can we know the way, Thomas said. Jesus said, I am the way. He is the way. When we know him, when we receive him as our personal Lord and Savior and turn our lives over to him, then when the time comes for our life on earth to end, he comes personally and, and ushers us into heaven. He said to his disciples, I'll come back and get you. I won't leave you as orphans. I'll come and receive you to myself because he wants to be with us. Just like we want to be together with each other, we long to be together, that his spirit within us draws us together, draws us to each other and draws us to him. And his spirit draws him to us. So Jesus said after he went away, he would send the Holy Spirit to them. He said the Holy Spirit is the spirit of truth. He would live in them forever and he would guide them into all truth. He said the Holy Spirit would speak only what he heard from the Father. <clears throat> and he would tell them things to come. He said the Spirit will set you free. Jesus said the world can't receive the spirit of truth because it neither sees him nor knows him. The Holy Spirit is invisible to the world, those who won't receive Jesus. He said to the followers, but you know him, for he dwells with you and he will be in you. <clears throat> so the spirit of truth is one of God's invisible weapons with which we can fight this invisible enemy of coronavirus. The next piece of God's armor is righteousness. We cover ourselves with the gown or the robe of righteousness, which means right standing with God. We don't get right standing with God by being good or by doing everything right because none of us can. The Bible says there's none good, no, not one. And Jesus, when somebody called him good, Jesus responded, why do you call me good? He said, there's none good but God. When we receive Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior, he forgives us of sin. He justifies us just as if I'd never sinned. And he redeems us from sin. He frees us from sin's power over us so that we no longer have to give in to sin. We can fight against it and overcome it. Not that we never do anything wrong again, because we do. We continually do things that are not right. Sometimes we don't mean to. As Paul said, I, I don't do what I want to do, and what I don't want to do, I do. He said that years after he was a Christian. But we have the privilege then of coming before the Father in the name of Jesus and receiving forgiveness each day. As we fall, he lifts us up and we go again. And then... God declares us righteous after we receive Jesus Christ. And he clothes us with his robe of righteousness. And then he sees Jesus in us. This is a free gift to us from God. We can't do anything to earn it. We can't be good enough. It's a gift from God. The second piece of God's armor is peace. The Bible says we have the good news of peace. Peace with God through faith in Jesus Christ. No longer a guilty conscience, no more shame, just peace with God. He said, wear that like shoes on your feet. As we continue to read God's word, to walk in his word, then our steps will be firm and sure because he'll guide us on the path that he wants us to go. We won't be confused about which way to go 
because he'll guide us by his spirit living in us. The third piece of God's armor is faith. We believe in God. Let's cover ourselves all over with our faith. And we can stop all those poison arrows that the devil continually sends our way. And the next piece of God's armor is salvation. The helmet of salvation, the Bible says, put it on like a helmet. Protect your head and your mind and your thoughts. We've been saved. Wear our salvation on our heads to protect ourselves. And then the next piece of God's armor is the word of God. The Bible says, take with us the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. For the word of God is powerful, even to the dividing asunder of thoughts and intents of the heart. Jesus defeated the devil by quoting scripture to him. We must know and memorize scripture to be able to use it when we need it, when the devil comes against us. This is having our sword ready, the sword of the spirit, which the Bible says is the word of God. While I was in quarantine, I pulled out a little book of healing scriptures that I've had for many years by Kenneth Hagin, <clears throat> a powerful um, evangelist who had a, a healing ministry. I read these scriptures over and over, and there was a particular verse in this little booklet that stood out to me from Psalm 91. There shall no evil befall thee, neither shall any plague come nigh thy dwelling. With long life will I satisfy him and show him my salvation. And do you know how sometimes a verse just stands out to you when you read it? Well, that little verse stood out to me as I read it. And I took that as God speaking just to me. There shall no evil befall thee, neither shall any plague come nigh thy dwelling. I said, thank you, Lord. Thank you that no plague will come near our home. And then with long life will I satisfy him. And I took that for my husband. I've prayed so many times for the Lord to lengthen his life and to keep him alive. With long life will I satisfy him and show him my salvation. So I took that verse personally. And whenever I would get concerned, which I still did, I would repeat that verse. And it would give me peace again. And finally, in the armor of God, the Bible says, pray always in the spirit. I think that's my motto. Pray without ceasing. Always talk to God in the spirit. Talk to him about everything and ask him for what you need, the Bible says. Put in a request for what you need, just like the healthcare workers have put in their request for gowns, for gloves, for shields, for masks, for ventilators, all the things at the beginning, at least they were desperate for, to help save the lives of people. The Bible says, put your mind on what you're saying, asking God to help all of his people. Coronavirus is a strong enemy. It's powerful. But when I first heard about it being named Corona, because it looks like a crown, my mind immediately thought of someone else who has a crown, and his crown is above every crown. The Bible says he is the king of kings and the Lord of lords. He's the king of everyone and everything. His name is Jesus, Jesus Christ. The Bible says he has all authority in heaven and on earth. You know, we don't hear much about those who've had coronavirus and have recovered. But I looked it up. And I was surprised to learn that most people who had the virus have recovered. So we need to give God praise for that. According to Reuters, out of 4 million who have been infected in the world, 3,716,000 have survived. And in North Carolina, out of the 14,000 people who've been infected, 13,493 have recovered. In New Hanover County, out of the 96 people who've been infected, 93 have recovered. So praise God for that. And praise God for the other good things that have come from these terrible times that we're living in now. Um, the showing of love among people. The time that people have had to spend with families. Maybe too much time sometimes when there's not enough that you can think of to do with the kids. Or you're together with your husband in a four-room home and not going anywhere for 
weeks on end. But it's been a good thing in some ways. So God has given us well-made weapons of the best materials. And he wants us to put them to use. <clears throat> so we will be able to stand up to everything the devil throws our way. The Bible says we need to be dressed head to toe in the full armor of God so that we can resist during these evil days and be prepared to fully stand our ground. So we don't look at the troubles we see now, but the Bible says fix our gaze on things that can't be seen. For the things we see now will soon be gone, but the things we cannot see will last forever. When we put on God's armor, we'll be fighting the real enemy who's at the root of this virus and all other diseases. Even if we should be infected, though, with coronavirus, and if we should die, the Bible says there's a crown waiting for us in heaven. It's a crown that'll never spoil or fade, and the Holy Spirit is given to us as a guarantee. Our body might be damaged from the fight, but our spirit will be strong, not by our efforts, but because the Holy Spirit of God lives there, and he will come and lead us home. Like Paul, we can say, we have fought a good fight. We have finished the race. And there's laid up for us and for all who believe and trust in Jesus Christ, a crown in heaven that will last forever. Amen. Will you pray with me now? Dear God of hope, please fill us with all joy and peace as we trust in you so that we may overflow with hope by the power of your Holy Spirit. Please cleanse us, Lord, of anything we've done that's wrong. Forgive us. Fill us with your Spirit, your Spirit of wisdom and revelation, so that we might know you better and come closer to you. Dear Lord, may the eyes of our hearts be enlightened, so that we may know the hope to which you have called us, the riches of your glorious inheritance in the saints, and your incomparably great power for us who believe. Please strengthen us with power through your spirit and our inner being so that Jesus Christ may dwell in our hearts through faith. We pray that we being rooted and established in love may have power to grasp how wide and long and high and deep is the love of Christ and to know that love that passes knowledge that we might be filled with all the fullness of God. Now may our love abound more and more in knowledge and in depth of insight so that we may be able to discern what is best, that we might be pure and blameless, that we might be filled with the fruit of righteousness that comes through Jesus Christ to the glory and praise of God. Now we'll pray together the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. I want to thank you so much for the generosity that you've shown to Grace United Methodist Church through your giving. We appreciate that so very much. Your offerings help to accomplish two things. Number one, as part of your discipleship, they are a tangible way for you to say to God, thank you for the armor that, of yours that you have provided for us for the, the protection that you give us during these days. Thank you, God, for that. Your offering is a tangible way to say that. Secondly, your offering helps those, us at Grace continue to be light to this world. During this pandemic, this place has continued to be light. The staff, the good people of Grace, have done many things to impact this community during the days of the coronavirus, and your giving helps that happen. We've checked on our neighbors to make sure they are okay. We've 
gone to get things for people who needed things. We have uh, established missions through uh, Mother Hubbard's Cupboard to provide food for the needy, specifically diabetic food, on which they were running low. We have helped Family Promise keep young families with children uh, off the streets. Your giving has helped that happen. We have helped New Hanover Regional Medical Center who needed masks. Our, our people have made masks and taken them there. Your giving helps these things happen. I know a number of folks are watching from other churches. I'm sure your churches are doing the same wonderful things. Uh, if you're watching from another church, feel free to give to your church. By all means, let me encourage you doing that. And thank you so much for your giving in this God-honoring kind of way. So how are you doing during these days? How can we pray for you? Feel free to send your prayer request. Let us know how we can pray for you and yours during these trying days. There's an email address on the screen. We want to pray over you in any way that would be meaningful to you. Feel free to let us know how you're doing. We're here and we are concerned for you and we are praying for you, but let us know uh, with specificity how we can do that, how we can be a blessing to you in that regard. We thank you for joining us today. And remember, as you step into this week, to put on the armor of God and step into the blessings that God has for you. Join us next week.